Well, hello there. Welcome to our online service. My name's Ez and I'm the Associate Minister at St. Luke's Liverpool. If you're new here, a special welcome to you. We're glad that you've joined us here today. Let's begin by praying together. In the midst of these new outbreaks in our city and in Victoria, please join me in prayer for our community. Our Heavenly Father, we commend to your keeping ourselves and each other our families and our neighbours, our friends and all the people of this city and our nation. By your spirit, enable us to live in love for you and for one another. Help us to lay aside our own concerns, focus our attention and care upon all who are most vulnerable and isolated among us. May we first pursue the good of those who are most anxious, fearful, sick and the lonely. May we mirror to others the fatherly attention and care you daily show us. Sovereign Lord, you alone are the hope and healer of your people. You have promised us the hope of a world where there will be no more sorrow, sickness, or dying. Comfort and heal, merciful Lord, all who are in sorrow, need, sickness, or any other trouble. By Jesus' death and resurrection, you have set your people free from both the penalty of sin and the fear of death. Give us a firm trust in your goodness and bring us into the joy of the bodily resurrection and the fulfillment of all your precious promises. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The wonderful thing is that through all this crisis, we don't need to pretend that we're in control of everything, but we know who sits on the throne. We know who is king. And that's the whole theme of today's Psalm, Psalm 2. And we'll get that in into that in a moment. But first, I'm going to ask Peter Lin, our Acting Senior Minister, to give us an announcement about what's happening with our church. Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well uh, in health and well in the Lord. Just wanted to give you a quick COVID update and church. Many of you will know that today we are restarting the kids program and this coming Friday plan to start uh, the youth program again. But just wanted to uh, forecast that, uh, as you know, there's been a, a, an outbreak of COVID-19 here in Southwest Sydney. And so we just wanna keep an eye on the numbers and to see if they're increasing or not, or whether there are more and more hotspots around the southwest of Sydney. And just to telegraph that we might have to suspend uh, children and youth programs uh, again. We don't want to, uh, but really we're trying to balance um, uh, physical well-being with, of course, spiritual well-being uh, and even mental well-being. Uh, and and uh, we really value your prayers for great wisdom uh, in what to do. But at the moment, uh, the kids are meeting now and youth group will meet this Friday. Uh, but just wanted to forewarn that we may have to uh, suspend those programs again. Uh, but uh, at the moment, that's the way it is. Please continue to pray for us. Thanks very much.
Let's pray before we hear God's word. Gracious God, your word is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Today, when we hear your voice, deliver us from hardness of heart. Help us to put away everything that keeps us from persevering in your way. For the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Bible reading is from Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Hi everyone, we're continuing our series in Psalms. Please keep your Bibles open at Psalm 2. But sometimes I watch those shows like Australia's Got Talent or Australian Idol. And you know, they show those audi auditions of people who are just so bad at singing. They can't sing in tune, they have no rhythm, they can't dance, but they think they are really talented. They have no self-awareness. Of course, most, if not all of us, have self-awareness issues where we are not what we think we might be. And today in Psalm 2, a psalm written by that first king of Israel, David, we're going to meet people with a serious lack of self-awareness. But we'll also get a window into the book of Psalms as chapter 1 and 2 are like an introduction to the whole book. But before we come to that, Come with me then to Psalm 2, verse 1 to 3, where this psalm starts with people who seriously lack self-awareness. So verse 1, it says, Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. Here we see nations conspiring and peoples plotting against God. We see kings and rulers gathering together and taking a stand against the Lord and against his anointed one. Now, anointed one is a reference to God's chosen king. And he's referred to as the anointed one because God's chosen king in the Old Testament was anointed with oil when enthroned. Now, why is it that these nations and kings stand against God? Well, in verse 3, it says they want to break the fetters and chains that bind them to God. Being subject to God for them is like being chained to him. So they are saying they don't want to be chained under God's control. They don't want to be under his rule. They do not want to have to take orders from God. They want to rule themselves. They are basically then defying God. And look at how God responds in verse 4. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. And God laughs and scoffs at them because these kings and rulers are coming before him and shaking their puny little fists in his face. 
Now that's laughable because that's like a guinea pig challenging a herd of stampeding elephants. Imagine the little fluffball guinea pig standing up to a herd of elephants and saying, come on, you big grey sissies, I'll have you. It's laughable. But unfortunately, it's not funny. Look with me at verse 5. Verse 5 says, he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. See, whilst their challenge to God is so pathetic, it's laughable, there is nothing funny about people in their arrogance defying the living God. And this arrogance and defiance stirs up his anger and wrath. Wrath is like another word for anger. In other words, you can't defy God and get away with it. So what does or will God do about it? Look at verse 6. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. That is the way God will deal with these kings and demonstrate who really is king is to put his chosen human king in place. Now, why should that terrify them? Well, verse 7 to 9 goes on to tell us three things about God's king. Firstly, he is God's son. Verse 7, he said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. See, this king will be no ordinary person, but be the son of God himself. He will be human, though, and he will be a descendant of King David, who wrote this psalm. Look at what God says to King David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, beginning verse 12. He says, when your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. So whoever this king is, it will be a son of David, that is a descendant of David, and God will call him son, son of David, son of God. Secondly, in verse 8, his kingship will be over all the earth and everyone in it. Look at verse 8. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You know, when you inherit something, it means it's yours. You own it. So God's anointed son king will rule over all the nations to the end of the earth. That's what he will inherit. They are his. The third thing it tells us about this king is in verse 9. It says, you will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Now, remember, this is poetry. Breaking them with a rod of iron is picture language for absolute authority in judgment. And dashing them to pieces like pottery is picture language for unrivaled power in judgment. See, God's king not only carries the authority of God, but has the power of God to smash them like a sledgehammer to a wine glass. That's why they should be terrified of God's king. If the king they defy can do this to them, then they better watch out. So how should they respond? Well, firstly, verse 10. Be wise and be warned. Therefore, verse 10, ye kings be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth. See, it is utter, utter stupidity to go up against God, to defy him. They don't stand a chance against God. God won't put up with them forever. To be wise is to be warned of what it means to defy God. But you know, in this warning, you also see God is gracious because he could have and had every right to squash these arrogant, foolish people like bugs right then and there, but no, he gives them warning. Secondly, verse 11 says, serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. It's interesting how these pairs of responses are put together. Serve with fear. Serving indicates who is boss and who is not. And to serve with fear is to serve with respect and reverence and, and recognition the, of the powerful authority of God who is to be served. Celebrating or rejoicing is appropriate too because God is good and you are not going to be destroyed. That's worth celebrating. 
but you should not take it for granted. You should not treat that lightly, hence celebrating with trembling. And thirdly, verse 12 says that they should kiss the son in response. Verse 12, kiss his son or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now, to kiss the son is an expression of paying honour and homage to one greater than yourself. It's like kissing the ring of a king or a bishop in some places. It's a good idea to submit to God's son, the king, because as it says in verse 12, the alternative, which is your own defiant way, will lead to destruction via God's wrath, which could come at any time. So submit to the king. That's how they are to respond to the king. Be wise, be warned, serve and submit. And that's true self-awareness, knowing that they were weak and powerless against the almighty God, knowing that as human beings, they are still subject to the king of creation. Now, that's how the people at the time and the generations after King David would have understood this psalm. And this psalm, you know, sets the scene for the rest of the book as it sheds more and more light on this king that we're introduced to here. But that's not all the psalms do. It's a large part of it. And as we go through the psalms, you'll see that as more and more is unveiled about this king we're introduced to, there is also the question of the identity of the king. Now, spoiler alert, the Bible tells us that the king the psalms is talking about is ultimately Jesus. Jesus himself says in Luke 24, verse 44, This is what I told you while I was with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me, Jesus says, in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Here, Jesus says he is the fulfillment of what the Psalms talk about, and in the end, who the Psalms therefore are pointing to. Now, also in Acts chapter 13, beginning verse 32, it says, We tell you the good news. What God promised our fathers, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus, as it is written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have become your father. The fact that God raised him from the dead, never to decay, is stated in these words. I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. He, the resurrected Jesus, God's son, is the king promised by God to David. Now, finally, to sum it all up, that Jesus is the son who is king and who rules, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 9. And notice here the quotes, uh, the quotes straight from Psalm 2, verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. Verse 5, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And then to verse 8, But about the son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Now, you'll notice in those verses so many of the things in relation to Jesus that, the, that Psalm 2 speaks about the king. It quotes Psalm 2 in verse 5 about Jesus being God's son. It also says Jesus is heir or inheritor of all things, that his throne or rule will last forever, that his rule with the scepter or rod uh, and, uh, uh, and it talks about anointing. Jesus is truly the fulfillment the king promised in Psalms. So as we build a picture of the king in Psalms, we are building our understanding of Jesus. 
So Psalm 1 to 2 then serves as, as an introduction as, uh, as the psalm unpacks more about this king and what it means for them to have the promise of this king, but also what it means to have God as their heavenly king. Well, what does this psalm mean for us today? Well, firstly, Jesus' kingship is not like all the kings of the Old Testament or even the kings of today. Remember Hebrews 1 verse 8, your throne will last forever and ever. In other words, Jesus is still king today and will be king forever. He's not only king then, but he is king now. This psalm tells us also or teaches us the right response to God's king. We too are to be wise and be warned because even though we may not be kings of nations like in this psalm, most of us think we are king of our own lives. If we think that, then we are sadly under an illusion. We lack self-awareness. Ultimate self-awareness is recognizing that God is king over everything and everyone and we are not. He's the creator. We are the created. He is the potter. We are but the clay. To not recognize that and to rule our own lives is to defy God's kingship and to shake our puny, pathetic little guinea pig fists in his face. I don't care what you say, God. You cannot boss me around. I do what I want to do, so get lost. The person who does this is not wise because it is utter, utter stupidity to defy God and think you can get away with it. It shows a complete lack of self-awareness about how powerless and weak and not in control we are compared to God. And God will not stand for this defiance, not forever. For the time being, he warns us out of his grace because he could, wipe us, he could wipe all of us out as well in an instant. But no, he is patient. So what should we do? Well, be self-aware. Be aware of where we stand in relation to God. That's the ultimate self-awareness, as I said. To recognise that God is king and we are not. How do we do that? Verse 11 and 12, serve and submit. Kiss the Son. In your hearts, bow down to him in humble service and undivided loyalty. He is the king. So in every decision we make in life, it is decided by who the king is in our life. And for us, it's God. So every decision we contemplate, we should ask, what does God the king want me to do in this situation? From how we spend our money or time or our, our, our work and jobs and careers or, or what we do in relationships to should I get up in the morning for church and a whole manner of other things and everything. What does the king want me to do? And if we don't ask that question or something like it, then we are doing what we want to do, not what the king wants us to do. And if that's the way we run out our lives, we will face the real king and experience the rule of his iron scepter. But if we submit to the king, Jesus Christ, then in him we will find refuge. Did you notice that at the end of verse 12? Blessed are all who take refuge in him. That's a beautiful and encouraging promise, isn't it? Those who live under the kingship of Jesus have refuge. You know why? It's because he is a good king, a gracious king. There is refuge, of course, from his judgment, but I think it's more than just that. There is refuge in serving and submitting to a king that is always good because there is nothing God or Jesus tells us to do which is not best for us. God's way is always designed to bless us. It is always the best way for us to live. And this takes us right back then to the beginning of chapter 1. Remember that? Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his Lord day and night. And then verse 3 after that is a picture of the flourishing life that comes from living under God's word, the blessed life. See, name one thing that God commands which is not best for us, not best for you. 
So in chapter 1, the blessed person delights in God's word and does it. In chapter 2, the blessed person is the one who submits and serves the king. The word to delight in then is the word of the king. So as we embark on the Psalms, be self-aware. You and I are not king. Jesus is. So delight in his word. Be wise and be warned. Serve and submit to him. For blessed are all who take refuge in Jesus. Let me pray for us. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus is king. We thank you that he is your appointed king. We thank you that he is the king that the Psalms were pointing to. And Father, we pray that as we learn more about King Jesus in the Psalms, you would enable us to be wise. You will uh, cause us to be warned. And Father, may we serve and submit to the King that you have placed in the throne forever and over all. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And we'll see you next time. God bless you. Well, I hope you've been able to watch our online service with other people from church and you can spend some time in fellowship together now. But if you haven't been able to, we'd love for you to join us for our online morning tea. You can join us on Zoom at 10.30 right after this. But for now, keep safe, God bless, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.